in the lane, 15, 10, touchdown, Chargers! What's up, guys? Welcome into an NFL Combine edition of Chargers Weekly. As always, joined by Matt Money Smith. Money raining here in Southern California. All the action is in Indianapolis, and our guy Daniel Popper on the scene. And Pop, I, I want to ask you about Brandon Staley and everything that's going on there. Um, but I just saw a tweet from you regarding Keenan Allen and his status with the Chargers. And I, I guess we could just start there. Why don't you, as a leaping off point, um, just kind of detail what you tweeted. Yeah, so got to meet with Tom Telesco here at the Combine. And um, he, pre- he said explicitly that Keenan Allen is, is not going anywhere. Um, obviously, there was some speculation. I think it got a little bit overblown. Um, just that's how media works these days. But, you know, the Chargers had the possibility of cutting Keenan Allen or trading him and saving some money against the cap. Of course, we all know that they're, you know, over $20 million over the cap, and they're going to have to make some moves here to get cap compliant by the new league year. So, you know, people are throwing out options for how they can get there. One option was moving on from Keenan Allen. There are a lot of other options that they could go down. Um, and it sounds like they're going to take these other avenues to try and keep the roster as close to what it was last year as they can because um, they believe they have a really good team. So that's where things stand. Um, and it's obviously good news because Keenan Allen is uh, a fantastic player. I think we can all agree on that. You know, I think the, the development of, of what's happened with wide receiver salaries, you know, made it less likely. You know, if, if wide receiver salaries are still in that, you know, 12 to 18 and the high end gets 20, then, yeah, I think it sort of started to make sense. It's like, wow, we, we've got the, the second highest, you know, earning wide receiver and he's on the wrong side of 30. Should we rethink this? But looking at what it's going to cost to replace a guy in free agency, you know, now that it's gone north of 25, it's sniffing 30 per year. I think that's one component too. I think Herbert's a big part of this. You know, when, when Keenan came back, it, that was his guy. I mean, it was all the targets again. It was all the third downs again. So I think there's that, that component. And I do think, you know, there's, there's an element of, of sort of trust that this is going to sound crazy, but that I don't know if, like they have with the other wide receivers. You know, I don't want to explicitly say Mike Williams' name, but I I think if you were to kind of say, hey, point blank, let's let's put him in order, I wouldn't be surprised if Keenan came in at number one, e- even though we know how explosive Mike is in those big plays. And I think the way they look at that wide receiver room, if you're slotting guys, I think you would probably put Keenan – I think the team, the front office, would probably put Keenan one, Mike two. I, I just think that's the pecking order, and you don't want to get rid of your number one. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anyone was was arguing that Keenan, you know, is is, you know, trending in the wrong direction. You know, he had a injured season last year, but what he does doesn't necessarily get valued by the outside world in the same way that maybe you know a Tyreek Hill or a Jalen Waddle, guys with speed, guys that make these right. explosive plays. Like Keenan's really good at like converting like third and fours. You know, he's really good in the red zone. He makes a lot of big plays on money downs, but he's he's not this explosive receiver that's going to show up on the highlight reel, but in terms of what teams teams value, you know, being highly productive in those key situations, being able to separate against man coverage on third down in the short and intermediate area of the field, like that's extremely important. Um, you know, but you, like I think the reason it became a story is because you have to look at the cap situation and figure out it was an okay, obvious number, right? Right. There's only so many ways you can do it. Like it's not like you can just you know reassemble your cap sheet every single year. There's certain levers that you can pull, and this was one lever that they could pull. I think I wrote in my column about it that, you know, the cap math gets more difficult if you keep Keenan, but not impossible. And that's the direction they're going. It's a little bit more difficult, and they're going to have to make some decisions in terms of restructuring contracts. But, you know, Keenan at that number still makes sense. Like, he's still worth that money. $24 million yeah. is the cap it. Like, that, he's still worth that if he plays a full, healthy season. And I think that's what the Chargers are expecting. He's still a fantastic player. And it's easy yeah, and Chris, to real quick, I would just, uh, yeah. I would just add, like, Pop or, or Chris, if you want to ask, I, like, I wouldn't be surprised if they restructure and they extend and they just kind of convert some of that to signing bonus and you can back end it and say, hey, man, we'll, we'll cut you a check for your 24 now. We'll tack two on the back, whether or not you see the, you know, you can play that game and at least try to take seven, eight million bucks off that number and just scratch out a big check to them here, you know, before the season starts and see if you can work it that way. And that's, you know, how you can shave. Like we said, because that's what you're going to have to do, right? It looks like they're going to probably try to piece all this together, and I would I would guess a lot of it's by restructuring and extending 
and tacking on years that some of these players aren't going to see. Yeah, those are all levers that they can pull, and there's various contracts that they can do it with. You know, Joey Bosa has another contract they, they, yeah. they can do it with. But the one point I want to make is that when you do that, the money just doesn't disappear from the cap. You have to wear that eventually in future seasons. Every dollar that, you know, guaranteed dollar that gets paid – you have to wear on the cap at some point. And so, yeah, you can create We said that about the Saints for 10 years, Pop. That's the thing. Like, every single year we say, oh, this is the year the Saints got to pay that check. And it's like every year they figure out how – no, they don't. They, When's the last they, time they, the Saints were actually, like, a Super Bowl contender? I mean, three years ago? Yeah. So, I mean, I, think, know, the, I think the last so, couple I mean, of years – So, I mean, yeah. you know, when, when, before, when Drew Brees retired, right? As right. long as he was their quarterback, for 10 years we heard how they got to pay the bill. And they never – same with the Rams. You know, now look, the Rams had to pay the bill this year because Andrew Whitworth retired, right, and their offensive line got completely destroyed. Yeah. But I just feel like the – I feel like the Chargers don't pull the levers that you're talking about or at least haven't in the past enough. And I think this may be the year we finally see them pull some of those levers yeah. that other teams have for a while. Yeah, I think so. I think you're, I think you're right. But you do eventually have to wear it. Like, yeah. you know, the, the – you know, the Saints had to had to trade C.J. Gardner-Johnson to the Eagles. Like, that's a really good player that they had to offload yeah. for cap reasons. You know, they haven't been particularly in the mix in recent years. I think, like, you're seeing them sort of, you know, pay the bills that they kept off-putting year after year after year. So it does come around. The other part of it is that you have to have the cash to do it as well. You know, like, like if, you do can, if you convert, you know, $15 million of base salary into signing bonus, like, that's a check. You got to pay year one versus paying it down the road. So, like, it's, there's obviously a lot of machinations here. Um, but, like, there's a reason that teams are able to massage it and get under the cap. Like, it's not a huge issue. It's just, like, how much cash are you going to pay up front and then how much dead money are you willing to wear in future seasons? And, and those are the two questions you have to answer. If, you, if you're willing to, you know, pay dead money in future seasons and you have the cash to do it, then absolutely you can pull these levers to, to kick the can down the road. I, I saw a quote this morning where – Tom Telesco said that he's our Charlie Joyner. He's our Andre Reed. And, you know, you could be prisoner of the moment and say, hey, he missed a lot of time this year. There was no player in the Chargers franchise over the first five years in L.A. more consistent than Keenan Allen. He played in nearly every single game, 1,000-yard seasons, 100-plus catches, six to eight touchdowns a season. And Justin sorely missed him when he was hurt and didn't have Keenan to rely upon. So I, I do think it makes sense. But – if you take Keenan out of the equation, Popper, they are going to have to make some, some moves. They are going to have to either restructure contracts or, or cut guys outright. And I, I'm looking at the Khalil Mack contract, and I just wonder what do they do with Khalil Mack? Do, do they try to restructure his deal? Um, he has a big cap number. I think Matt Filer has a decent uh, cap number. Uh, what other players are we looking at here? Yeah, I mean, the timing of it's going to be pretty interesting to me. Um, you know, they're 20 million and change over the cap right now. And they ha that's the money they have to clear to get cap compliant by 1 p.m. Pacific time on March 15th. They can do that with two moves. Cutting Matt Filer, restructuring Joey with the maximum amount of savings on the restructure. That gets them cap compliant by the new league year. And then they can sort of just operate and, and um, you know, make decisions and pull levers based on different deadlines. Um, you know, I go back to like when they cut Brian Bulaga last offseason. They kind of waited until they had made a bunch of moves in free agency before they felt like, okay, we need a little bit more space to round out this roster. And then they made that move like three days before Brian Bulaga's roster bonus was due. So I think you'll sort of see the moves trickle out over time depending on what they feel like they need to do. But you can start with those two moves, get camp compliant by, um, you know, March 15th and then, and then move from there. You know, the one thing I'll say is I don't really expect them to be particularly active in free agency. Like, I don't think there's any scenario where they're able to really um, make decisions like they did in previous seasons. Like, and I think on top of that, I don't think they're going to have enough space to really round out the roster with veterans. Like, they're going to be looking toward this draft class that they're bringing in with the seven picks that they have to, to bolster that depth. And then they might be able to find some bargains on the open market. But that's sort of what you're looking at um, in terms of, you know, how they're going to operate moving forward. But I would start there with restructuring Joey because, you know, borrowing from the Bank of Bosa and then, you know, cutting Matt Filer. Um, who was outstanding in his first season, but took a, a little bit of a step back last year. They can save six and a half million there and then sort of see what levers you want to pull moving forward in terms of restructuring, in terms of cutting other players, whether that's, you know, restructuring Khalil again. I mean, they did restructure Khalil after they traded for him. 
So there was no guaranteed money remaining on that deal. Now there is some guaranteed money, $9 million in dead money that they that re, they restructured to future seasons. So they could potentially do that again. They could restructure Sebastian, Joseph Day, um, you know, Gerald Everett can get cut in, you can say $4.25 million. So there's a lot of different levers that you can put. You can pull, and I'm just kind of fascinated to see which levers they decide to pull and when they decide to do them. And, and that's sort of what we'll find out over the coming weeks. Yeah, I think um – Hunter, you know, like it's impossible not to agree with you. They don't have the money to, to dip deep into the free agent pool. They did it last year. You know, last year was their big swing. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was, you know, we feel like we have the offense. Brandon, what do you need on defense? We'll go buy it, and let's see if we can make the Super Bowl. And that's what they did. And they spent a grip of cash on Khalil Mack, on J.C. Jackson, filled out the roster with Austin and, and Sebastian. And, and, look, it just didn't work. Um, you know, and it got them a 27-0 lead in the first half of the playoffs, and they made the playoffs, and that certainly is success. But I think just kind of going back to as, as we try to figure out how they're, you know, the question you ask, Chris, is how do they do this? Yeah. Going back to Jacksonville, I do think there's, you know, however you want to describe it, recency bias, scar tissue. You know, they couldn't get a first down, and they couldn't get off the field on third down. And I think that's what they've got to figure out through the draft, through who they're going to resign, through who gets to stay and who goes – and I think that's, hey, we were good enough to win 10 games, probably could have won 11, you know, depending on how they would have approached that second half of the, the Broncos game or how into that game they really would have been. Um, so I, I do think, you know, you don't want to take 19 or, you know, 18 games and, and focus on one half, but I think that's going to go a long way because it was a problem all year, you know, that the pass rush had issues all year because of injury. Their, their, the run game was essentially non-existent on designed runs when you needed to run the ball to win football games. So I, you know, Pop, as I look at it, through the, I'm looking at it through that lens. You know, what, what is it that they can do? Who is it that can go and can stay? You mentioned Filer. It just seems so obvious if you can get Trey Pipkins, figure that out, to kick Jamari inside. He's your guard, and now you've got a whole line with – you know, three rookies and two veterans, you know, that's an affordable offensive line now moving forward for the next couple of years. And a good offensive line. You know, restructuring Bosa, you know, probably drafting two, maybe three (laughs) pass rushers to try to get some depth in that room, you know, makes sense keeping Khalil and hoping that Rumpf can get healthy and take, you know, all the, like that's sort of the way I'm trying to view you know, free agents or, um, you know, the restructuring, who gets to say who goes and who, what to draft. And, and you mentioned Gerald Everett. To me, that seems obvious. I, I just think that's – and look, a lot of it is going to depend on how the draft breaks. But we've heard everybody say it. It's a great tight end draft. Chris, we've talked about it repeatedly. Yeah. You know, I have not been bashful uh, about my Dalton Kincaid bias haven't called that one game that it was the greatest tight end game in the history of he's our guy he's an early clubhouse guy right exactly i was in after i was getting on the plane home texting telesco not really like hey i got your guy (laughs) he just absolutely destroyed usc so you know look there's tight ends that they can draft and i and i think that's an if you want to shift there whatever you know maybe i'm jumping it here you know when it comes to that first round pick it it just seems like maybe it all lays out all right for them the way this thing could break with what they have to do and and what might be available I think the other thing I'd add is injuries were such a big part of what happened to this team last year you know and I think I wrote it during the season you know there's a difference to me between explanations and excuses I think people in the football world hate to you know talk about injuries because they view it as an excuse but for me as an objective observer you know trying to explain what happened like injuries were an explanation for why you know this team maybe didn't reach expectations throughout the season and I think there's a feeling that, you know, the Chargers want to see this product in its complete form. And they don't feel like they really ever got to see that last year. You know, Rashawn Slater never returned. You know, one of the best left tackles in football. You had Justin Herbert battling rib injuries all year. You had Keenan out. You had Mike Williams out. J.C. Jackson goes down with an injury. You know, the defensive line gets cleaned out. Like, it's – you can go down the list of all of these injuries that they had. And so they felt like they built a really, really good roster, Super Bowl – caliber roster last year and then never really got to see it come to fruition now like obviously you're not going to stay fully healthy across the board all year but I think we can all agree that last year was crazy insane you know and so I think that's factoring into how they're making some of these decisions too like hey if we can pull some of these levers and and you know kick the can down the road a little bit just to see this group play together for a full season and see what they are actually capable of capable of 
I think that's a big motivation here in, in, in sort of how they're going to build this thing and move forward. But I, I agree, like, you know, three positions that I would throw out, you know, I feel like they need an edge rusher. I feel like they need a tight end. And, I like, I would add a receiver. Like, I think you should 100%. be drafting, you should be drafting a receiver Absolutely. early every single year when you have Justin Herbert because you never know what weapon is going to take the offense over the top. Like, you can never have enough weapons. So, I think, t- like, tight end, wide receiver, edge, those three, if you can add those three pieces in the early rounds, I think you're in – in decent shape if you can keep the nucleus together, you know, by managing the cap in a specific way. Pop, in your article, you mentioned some of the guys that uh, are free agents that they have to take care of, um, potentially. We, we don't know exactly who they're going to take care of. It, it sounds like, in you know, I, don't, I was just kind of reading between the lines that, that Nas Adderley may be uh, on his way to, to test free agency and be on another team in, in 2023. Um, is that accurate? And, and is Drew Tranquil... How much of a priority is Drew Tranquil in bringing him back? Yeah, well, starting with Nasir Adderley, I think the way Alohi Gilman played, and more importantly, how the defense played when Alohi Gilman got a lot of snaps and was a starter, I think gives you a good indication of like yeah. what the, what they're feeling about this safety group. Um, you know, Nas always had a ton of talent and just never really reached the level that I thought he was capable of. Um, you know, we all saw the ball production that he had at Delaware, but there was just some inconsistencies there, um, lapses at certain times, whether that was in run defense and coverage and how he was taking angles, never became the playmaker that I thought he was capable of. And although he did a lot of those things, he's not the same, you know, in, in, uh, as the, Nasir Adderley in terms of physical talent, um, but he's an extremely smart player, um, physical, um, and dependable. And so I think they're really comfortable rolling with Derwin and Alohi next year at safety. And then I think they're expecting a huge jump from JT Woods. You know, he has every tool in the toolbox. Um, You know, obviously we saw him a little bit last year, but I think they're hoping that year one to year two, there's going to be a huge jump there. So I think in in terms of safety, um, you know, they're pretty comfortable with that. You know, for me, like, I I think that Trey Pipkins is a great player. Like, I really do. I'm like – it was finally, he finally realized, you know, it, it took you know, four years, but he finally realized what Tom and his staff saw when they drafted him. And he, his first season was my first season covering the team. He had been drafted in, you know, end of April. I started covering the team, you know, that July. And so I've seen, like, I've seen him grow. And it's just, I give him so much credit for, you know, making the decision to go to Dallas and working with Duke Manyweather and really, like, molding himself and his game to become a starting caliber tackle. And, like, those are always the players that Tom Telesco right. likes to reward. You and know, being and same, tough. Being tough and playing through an MCL yes. spray and still being, like, a starting caliber Huge player deal. when he had, you know, three different setbacks when he kept getting rolled up on, on that left knee. Like, and he, the, before he got hurt, he was playing at a super, super high level. Yeah. And so, like, I feel like that's a guy that you'd want to resign. But, again, it's all going to, you know – come down to how much space they have and the same thing with drew right fourth yeah. round pick um you know they felt like he could develop into a real leader vocal leader they felt like he could develop into like you know the, an all-around mike linebacker who could be that that captain of the defenses which, which is what he turned into this season when he became the signal caller in week four and held on to that role you know there is no real weakness in his game in my opinion he can rush the passer he's great in coverage i think he's a disciplined run defender his size shows up a little bit in that area but if, like if you want to knock him in one area it would be that but i think he's a really reliable player um the question is like can you clear enough space to bring those two guys back like they're both going to have markets out here especially trey pipkins as a starting tackle and so like we just have to wait and see honestly to see what the cap space situation is what those guys' markets end up being and, and if the Chargers can fit them into the cap sheet and, and if they think that they can have a solution without bringing those guys back. You know, I think they could potentially have a solution f- for Drew. You know, they have some guys on the roster, and, you know, you could play with more defensive backs and do different things to, to take some of the value away from the inside linebacker. But, like, right tackle is a really important position. It's okay, like, you don't resign Trey. You kick Jamari out there, Salier. Does that mean you have to keep Matt Filer at left guard? That – means you can't clear the six and a half million dollars in space you know there's in and you end up going down a rabbit hole so um but I, I i think both of them are really good players and, and deserve second contracts wherever they end up yeah i think you know for me i you know i i totally understood when kaiser left last year i was like i get it you know i i get it but for me drew is i would hate to see him go you know we we, we had a front row seat for the difference between athletic traits and instincts at that position and you want to talk about a glaring difference it, it that is a position where instincts are the premium and you better have them because if you don't holy hell does it get ugly in a hurry and they will attack the heck out of you yeah. and we saw it we saw it in that second half and I think to to be able to keep him around you know that's 
I think you can just talk about the floor of a defense, right? If the floor can drop out in a hurry, if, if that position is not quick to diagnose, um, you can really attack it. And so, like you said, Daniel, the trick is going to be what's his market. He's, I would not be surprised if Drew got offered some money somewhere else and, and the Chargers got to figure out how to get as close to it as possible. Um, you know, he started his family here. I think he likes it here. And I think it's trying to find that, that spot where, where you can make it work. Um, Trey to me is obvious. We've heard Tom say it. You know, there's he said it repeatedly. Almost nobody in the NFL has two starting caliber tackles. If you just go through rosters, there's almost no teams that have two good tackles. They have one, and then it's like, okay, yeah, we can get by with this one, and we'll just shade our help that way, and we'll run plays away from. When you can have two, it really changes the calculus. So, even though you'd feel good about putting Jamari over there, um, I, I think to me it. To, to be able to, and it goes back to our conversation we had, Chris, uh, about the Andrew Luck podcast and what Tom got to witness, you know, and how yeah. important offensive line is and the fact that they ignored that position repeatedly in Indianapolis or swung and missed repeatedly in Indianapolis and what it meant. Like, to me, priority one is get Justin figured out. Priority two is make sure he's good up front. Let's make sure that we keep our guy right, especially after shoulder surgery and a rib injury. Let's when, when Corey Lindsley went out of the game, let's make sure our old line is right. So I, I, think, I think you hit it on the head, Pop. I think at Nas, I just don't see it. Trey's going to be priority one. I think Tranquil will be priority two. And then we got to get into, you know, is it possible to bring back Morgan Fox, Kyle Van Noy? Like, are those possibilities? What's the market going to look like for those guys who seem to really enjoy their time here as well? Money, yeah. real, real quick on Trey before you answer, Popper. It would be a real shame if the Chargers – couldn't get something done with Trey after develop or developing him and investing so much in him as a young raw player, right? To see him flourish this year and then go somewhere else and flourish for another team uh, on a pretty big contract. It would it would be tough, I think, for for the Chargers to to see him somewhere else after they invested a third round pick on a small school kid, knowing that it was going to take some time. He finally figures it out. And then he goes somewhere else. That would be tough. I mean, it's it's just math. You know, look, the, the Raiders are $60 million under the cap and can use a right tackle. You know, yep. if they decide they're going to give them $20 million bucks a year, it, it makes it hard, you know, when you're yeah. already $20 million. That's the problem is, like I just – teams don't have quality tackles. So Trey's going to hit the market, and Trey's going to – I'm assuming no, I, I'm he's going to get that. offers. No doubt. You know, that's, I, I just say it's going to be it's going to be tough to yeah. s- tough pill to swallow, right? Yeah. What are the you, Bears? One hundred one hundred and ten million bucks under the cap or something? I mean, the yeah, Bears need give, to rebuild an entire they offensive give Trey line. Trey a ton of money. You're right. That's what I mean. So it's yeah, and he's an ascending player too. Exactly. It's not like you're paying for a thirty year old finished product. Like fo- Trey's right. Trey's best football is still in front of him because he was playing through this injury last year. If you get like an even remotely healthy season out of him, it's going to be even better than he was last year. He's going to be what he was in the first four weeks of the season. Now here's an interesting one. Because, and look, is it fair to Trey? No. But franchise tag is not for tackles. It's for O-linemen. And it averages out across the entire offensive line. So, it, again, I don't know how he would respond to that. But you tag him, and you're talking about a year at, I don't know what the number is. It's like maybe 13, 14 million bucks. And it's, again, not fair. Probably would not go over well in the Pipkins camp, but to me, that's like everyone's talking about franchise tag. That's one that I would would keep it. I could probably type it in right now and try to figure out what that number is, but I'm pretty sure if I remember right, I do believe that's the way the, the NFL franchise tag works. It is not tackle, guard, center. It is offensive line is the franchise number. So, okay, either way, though, if you tag a player, that salary is all cap hit. Right. And they don't like you don't they don't have the space to take on a thirteen million dollar cap it, a twelve million dollar cap it, an eleven yeah. million dollar cap it. Like they're better off extending him, giving him a four year deal, getting a four million dollar cap it in year and, one and, and then restructuring it in the back, yeah. you know, give him the signing bonus. That's the game the, they're playing now. Like they don't have yeah. like taking yeah, on that line much is eighteen year one. million, by the way. Eighteen million. Is that uh, Orlando 18. Brown hey, they Orlando Brown that. got franchised no last shot. year by the Chiefs, that's right? Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, no no chance. And he might get franchised again, who knows? Yeah. I mean with what the tackle market is. I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated to see what Trey's market ends up being, you know, because they maybe like, we overvalue him here because we saw the development. Mm. It's very possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, you know, for people on the outside, it'll be difficult to separate the performance from the injury. I think for us, like 
we know what he was dealing with, and we're yeah. factoring that context into like, okay, yeah, he gave a couple pressures in this game, but he can barely move his left leg, and like the fact that he's playing so well in pass protection despite that is really impressive. I don't know if that context, you know, really factors in at a high level, and when other teams are sort of evaluating a guy on film, but maybe maybe they do, maybe they do that type of due diligence. I think it probably varies from team to team, but yeah, like this is why you end up bringing up guys like Khalil Mack like Keenan Allen, where you have a potential to save money and save cap space because the math starts to get very difficult when you talk about re-signing right. some of these guys, you know, whether it's Trey, whether it's Drew, whether it's Kyle Van Noy, Morgan Fox, Bryce Callahan, all key contributors and starters in this team last year. How many of those guys are end up, end up back next year? I mean, here's your, you know, it's 31 for Joey. That's an obvious restructure. That's yeah. going to happen. Uh, Khalil 27-4, Keenan 21-7. Mike, 19. JC just got signed. There's way too much dead money there. Unless you restructure it and you try to rebuild that thing already. That's risky. That's... That one is risky to me because you, they have no idea how he's going to respond from this exactly. injury. So the one so, that they could do is Sebastian because that's more of a known quantity and you feel like he's, yeah, 9 got, million. he's got two two years left at, at a high level. I think that's like a safer bet than saying, okay, we're going to restructure JC yeah. and, and erase our ability to get out of that contract after next year if he yeah, comes back. No and, you know. So, uh, what about what about Mac and restructuring? Do you think that's a possibility? You said there was some guaranteed money already there, right? Yeah. Again, like if they're if they're shifting how they operate, then anything is possible. If they're really going down this road of like we're going to keep this window open, I know Tom hates using that term, but if we're going to keep this window open with this group as long as possible, then anything's on the table. You know, from a in terms of like you know financial responsibility, like restructuring a contract year over year over year is how you end up in a situation where you have a ton of dead money, um, and it gives you less flexibility in terms of moving on from a player. And so in Khalil's case, you know they restructured it last year. They spread you know thirteen and a half million over three years. That created nine, you know, nine million over the final two years of the deal in dead money that they would now have to wear against their cap if they were to move on from Khalil this off this off season. If they hadn't restructured it, there would have been no dead money, and they could have gotten out of the deal and had and had nothing charged against the cap and so that's sort of how that works so right now it's a nine million dollar dead money charge if they turn more base salary into signing bonus and spread it over the final two years of the deal um there'll be even more dead money than nine million dollars and then eventually you have to wear that money against the cap you know and like yeah. for the cap and, continues yeah. to go up the right cap and so it's all percentages so that's right. so like that that's where you get the relief is right. you know we just had the cap jump what was it 16 million this last year or something like that then the granted yeah, yeah. a lot of that was built into the COVID yeah. and, and slowly yeah. getting that escalator but uh, I think we have one more big money deal coming in, um, you know, to the league. So that's the other thing to remember is you can, and that's why these quarterback numbers that are nuts. And you know, if Joe, if if, if Justin averages fifty million a year, what forty eight million a year, that number's just going to grow. So it's not going to be as big of a percentage and as big of a concern. And that's why, like you know, you look at the Patrick Mahomes contract, and it's just like it seems so ridiculous when it was done. But now you look at the percentage of the cap, and it's you end up getting away with it. So that's you know, where, where it all comes in. But I think you said something earlier, Pop, that, that people need to remember is guaranteed money has to go into escrow. And you've got, and, and we know what the check is going to look like going into escrow for Justin Herbert this off season. You know, the Spanos family is going to have to write a 150, 100, whatever that number is going to be, you know, um, you know, $120 million. Ch- I don't know what the guaranteed money is going to be, but it's going to be in that range. Yeah, you know, it's going to be guaranteed one t- money. Yeah, I think I projected it like 135 fully guaranteed yeah. at signing. So that, yeah, that's got to you got to have that. You've yeah. got to have that money. It's yeah. just the, it's it's a ridiculous rule that the NFL won't get rid of because owners can hide behind it and say, well, come on, I can't give you 260 million guaranteed because I got to write a check into escrow, and that's how they kind of play that game. But they should lose it. The league makes waste too much money now. That freaking Washington is going to sell their team for seven billion dollars. It's like it doesn't matter anymore like it used to. Yeah, but that's. That's the reality is, you know, there are not many owners that can write a check for $250 million, you know, on Tuesday in April (laughs) and just drop it into a bank and never see it again. And that's and and that's the reality of the way this league operates. So that's where a lot of it gets tricky when you're talking about restructuring and converting salary into, you know, bonus for Khalil Mack or Joey Bosa. Yeah. as it as it you know pairs with the the signing bonus for Justin Herbert that's coming this year, Pop, I, I appreciate you breaking that down too, especially with with Khalil's situation. What what they did 
in the first year of, of his deal with the Chargers and, and how they kind of uh, move some of that money around. Um, and it just kind of puts them in this current position. Um, you know, we talked about Filer, we talked about Keenan. And money, to your point, I mean, look at, look at some of the cap space. The, the Bears have $98 million in cap space. Yeah. I'm looking at Spochak right now. Atlanta has $66 million. The Raiders have $46 million. The Giants, who were in the playoffs last year, $43 million. New England has $36 million. Cincinnati has $36 million. Houston uh, has $34 million. Baltimore, twenty five. Seattle, 24 So there's, yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of teams that, well, A, everyone needs a tackle at, at all times, right, whether it's for depth purposes or to have a starter. Um, a guy like Drew, you know, all those teams, you, you can find a, a home for Drew probably uh, among those top ten teams with cap space too. So um, it, it's an interesting offseason for the Chargers because it, not, not much turnover will happen in terms of a, a lot of the starters. Um, you're really going to have to hit on your draft picks, and you're going to have to be very selective in free agency how you use that money. Yeah, and I think the, the one thing about the NFL um, and really any – professional sports league is for for fans to understand you know that your career is fleeting it's a capricious occupation because everything can change in one play yeah so you know loyalty there's just it doesn't even it's it's a word that doesn't belong in professional sports you just you can't afford to be loyal you know you you have to take the biggest check out there especially in football because of the way the contracts are structured uh, the length of the contracts, rarely will you find a team, you know, give you X number of years with a, a giant number attached to it unless you're a quarterback um, or a super elite player. So for players like Trey and, and Drew, that's just the reality of it. You know, this is your opportunity. You have, you have made your way to the pot of gold. You know, you've, you've slid down that rainbow. And I know you enjoyed the ride, but the reality is you almost never, I mean, it is maybe 1% of 1% will you see a player go or stay somewhere because they really liked it instead yeah. of taking the most money. You just, so that's, that's where a lot of this, when you're trying to kind of put odds on it, you know, they may be a little bit longer than Charger fans hope because it is, yeah. it's very hard. They took their swing last year, you know, yeah. and look, I credit, and I think that's something to, that's important to remember. If, if fans get upset, how can you let these guys walk? You're so cheap. They were not cheap last year. They wrote giant checks last year because they felt like we're ready we're going to take the swing we think we can win a super bowl let's go you know spend the money and they did and now you know to your point pop to some degree the bill is due this year because of what they did last year you know it really was a swing for 2022 it was a huge swing and And i think the Khalil restructure is a good example of that because they didn't have to do that but they cleared another nine million in space that they ended up using to sign gerald everett and kyle vannoy and morgan fox and bryce callahan and how important were those pieces to having the necessary depth you know to to ride through these injuries and still make the playoffs you know but that would be my concern about how they're building it this year is let's say okay we need rookie contracts because we need cheap cheap players to add to this cap sheet can you build the same kind of depth that you built last year when you made some of these really good bargain deals in the free agent market, you know, if you if you lean toward rookie contracts as your depth pieces as opposed to veteran free agents as your depth pieces, there's a, inherently a lot more risk there because you don't know how that player is going to transition to the NFL. You know, you know, Bryce had some injury, his, some injury history. You know, Kyle Van Noy, um, you know, we didn't fully expect, you know, what, 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 what he was going to be able to do, but it was a little bit more of a known quantity than bringing in a fourth round draft pick to be your third edge rusher or, you know, a fifth round pick to be your backup outside corner, whatever it ends up being, you know? And so I feel like it's inherently a little bit more risky to go that route, but it's what they have to do. You know, it's what they have to well, do. Well, I think the easy way to, to, to work that exercise pop is let's just look at last year, you know, first round Zion. Great. Second round was Khalil. Great. Third round JT Woods didn't play a lick. Fourth round Isaiah Spiller doesn't play a lick. Fifth round Tito great you know great depth piece started to yep. come on became a starter gets uh-huh. hurt sixth round Jossier you know and Jamari you know and you get one really giant contribution and one solid contribution and then Dean Leonard it is you know and, and Horvath are you know m- very small contributors or you know solid so I think that's what you can expect from a draft right and, and, and that was probably really good mm-hmm. I, I think what you got out of the draft last year was 
probably higher than you should expect. Now, look at what the Chiefs got, four defensive starters, but that's ridiculous. Like that, you know, what the Jets got, what the Seahawks got, that, that's an outlier. Yeah. So I think I mean, when you got you're, 16 starts at, at left tackle out of your six round pick, I think. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that's a, win. a huge win. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's when you look at the draft this year, they're not going to get any compensation picks because of all the free agents they signed last year. So their seven picks are their seven picks. I would not be surprised in the least to see them try to add more if that's what you're talking about, Pop. I know Telesco does not trade down a lot, but, you know, that's a real – I think that might be a real possibility if you're talking yeah. about trying to build depth. You want more bites at the apple. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's this could be one of those years where, hey, yeah, I'd, I'd love to take the speed receiver here. It's not a great wide receiver class. I don't know what kind of run we're going to see. You know, do you feel like you can get that tight end? If by trading out of 21 in the second round, maybe Musgrave slides back there or something like, you know what I mean, as opposed to Mayer or Kincaid or so. I wouldn't be surprised if they take that approach, um, you know, to just to try to rebuild that depth and reset that cap number. Um, but as you said, that's a huge gamble with how much talent they have on this team right now, the age of that talent and, and kind of where they see themselves in the, in the pecking order in the AFC. All right, guys, as the official hospitality provider of the NFL, On Location offers unrivaled access to experience all premier NFL events like never before. On Location brings you up close for all the action, providing fans with unforgettable moments from draft day to Super Bowl Sunday and everything in between. On Location, thrilled to announce its new partnership with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. This August, kick off football season in Canton, Ohio, and be there live to witness the class of 2023 enshrinement. The NFL also headed back to London and Germany for the 2023 NFL International Games. On location official packages will feature game tickets, deluxe hotel accommodations, private tours, pregame hospitality, end to end planning, and more. Be sure to secure your priority access today. Visit NFLOnLocation.com or search NFL On Location today. Your football experience of a lifetime awaits only with On Location. So, Pop, I look at Bosa and Mack, and that was the plan last year was to have those guys be together for a full season. Didn't work out that way. Khalil did play the entire season. Um, those guys returning, let's say for the sake of this conversation, both those guys return, you're still very light at edge rusher behind those guys. Uh, do you think it may be worth looking at edge rusher in the first round, knowing that you can't get a guy in free agency that that's going to make that big of an impact with with the money situation um looking at what the edge rusher class looks like in that first round in the mid to, to late uh first round do you think that may be worth a gamble to, to go after a pass rusher absolutely yeah I, I think they could go any any way with three positions in, in the first round i think they could do tight end wide receiver or edge like those are the three play, places that i think they can go Mm-hmm. Um, there should be some options there. I mean, it sort of depends how it falls. Does a guy like Lucas Van Ness at, a, at a Iowa fall that far? Typically, you know, when you get closer to the draft, these edge rushers end up going earlier than you expect because, you know, Money was saying everyone's looking for a tackle. Everyone's also looking for an edge rusher, yeah. you know. And so, that tackle. <laughs> right, exactly. And so they end up getting, I don't want to say overdrafted, but maybe they go ahead of where people expect. Yeah. Um, it's, so just it depends on how it shakes out. But, like, I think it's usually a good indication of roster health when you can say, okay, we can go any of three positions in the first round, you know, versus like we need this position, which right. has been the case with this team in the past. Like the year they drafted Rashawn Slater and Asante Ooh. in the first two rounds, like they yeah, had lucky. to go tackle corner. Like they, ha- whatever, you know, order it ended up being, those two positions they had to get in the first two yeah. rounds. Both they got, big hits. Yeah, both big hits. I mean, one of them was, you know, a 500 foot home oh, run. Man, and then Asante, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And World then Series Asante, Grand Slam, bottom of the ninth, yeah. two outs. <laughs> yeah, and Asante does a lot of things really well. I know he's, he's a flawed player, but, you know, a lot of cornerbacks are flawed. I think he's, he's perfectly fine. He's a great number two corner. But, yeah, like you don't want to be in that situa- situation if you can uh, avoid it. I think a lot of teams will always be like best player available. But it's, that, that, that to me is a myth. Like every team has needs. You're hoping that you can address any of a few needs in those early rounds and have some versatility in terms of how you go about it. Edge to me is in that conversation. Um, because you need to have a backup plan in case one of those two guys is not there because we saw what happened last year. And, yeah, Kyle Vinoy picked it up down the stretch. He played his, you know, played outstanding football down the stretch. Um, but it took him a while to get there and to get into his comfort zone. And, and uh, you know, if you look at the season as a whole, like the pressure numbers weren't really there, especially from the edge rushing group. 
Um, and so I think they have to add an edge rusher early on in this draft because um, you don't know exactly what Chris Rumpf is going to be, and you need to have depth and a contingency plan at that position. Um, you know, which I brought this up, Pop, a couple weeks ago, and um, in just watching Philadelphia that had the greatest pass rush that we've seen in uh, 30 years, 70 sacks, uh, and it being completely nullified by Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs in the Super Bowl. I said, you know what? I just don't care. I just, you know, when, if that's because, you know, we talked about, look, you've got grades on players and the, the, the Chargers are going to go into the draft with probably 17 or 15 or maybe if it's a really good draft, 20 first round grades. And that's where needs come in. When you talk about best pay, player available, they're going to end up having seven or eight players that have almost identical grades. And that's how needs come into play. Right. So technically they can still say, yeah, we're taking the best player available. But we had all of these guys lined up very, very close to one another, and we need the edge, or we need the receiver, we need the tennis. So we plucked that particular player. But I said, I would just load up on offense. I, I, I think, you know, I, I, like to me, I, I would much rather, with what they have on offense, with Herbert, with the offensive line, with Keenan and, and Austin, just give me more offense. Give yeah, me an absolutely. Everyone. Yeah, give me an up, unstoppable offense versus trying to plug this hole on defense that I know ultimately – is probably going to be taken advantage of because of the rules and because of Joe Burrow and Patrick Mahomes and the and Josh Allen and the quarterbacks that you're going to have to go through. It's going to it's almost impossible to build a defense to stop them. Like I just that, that's sort of the way I feel the NFL has shifted and the way the game is gone. It is so hard to slow these elite quarterbacks down that I would rather make sure the offense has every single weapon available to just freaking heavyweight fight, haymaker it out, and see if you can win that game like the Chiefs did with your opponent scoring 30 in the Super Bowl. You know, like to me, that's – I just think with Burrow and Mahomes and Allen and all of these guys in this conference, like honestly, how realistic is it that your defense is going to, is going to keep all of them – like, they, oh, you're going to build a defense to slow those guys down mm. round after round after round? <laughs> To me, I'd rather just build the offense that's like, hey, let's go. Let's just see how this plays out, roll the ball out, and let's see what we can do. Yeah. But, you know, the Chiefs also lost the Super Bowl because they couldn't protect Patrick Mahomes. So, right. Uh, you know, offensive I think, line. <laughs> that's what I mean, you know. The, yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I see what you're saying. I, I still, I mean, maybe it was me, you know, growing up watching those Giants teams with O.C. Umanora sure. and Michael Strahan and And that Justin was how Tuck. long ago? Uh, you know. But you know I, what I, I mean? like, yeah, no, I, I the, the 49ers what you're got saying. there, but ultimately, you know, they ended up losing, you know, and, and yes, the, the two years ago, Mahomes got destroyed by that Tampa front in the, in the Super Bowl. But how explosive was that offense with Tom Brady? You know, I mean, that yeah. thing was paired with an offense that was a wrecking machine and, yeah. you know, I like to, and that's not me saying ignore the defense. I'm just saying, Hey, if I'm sitting at 21, and I'm Tom, and I see, you know, either, hey, we really – here's here's our first-round grades. We've got a first-round grade on Kincaid. We've got a first-round grade on Brees or wh- whatever edge is there. We've got a first-round grade on Addison. Give me the offensive player. I would just much rather take the offensive player there and try to find that defensive player in the next round. I, I Like, to me, I'd rather make the offense yeah. as whole as possible. Yeah, I, I think you're making great points. What's your take on wait, uh, B. John right. Robinson? Make your, hold on, wait, let me say this real quick. Go for it. Money, make your case to the uh, the defensive play calling head coach and, and let me know what he says about, about that strategy. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, uh, like, you know what I would say? <laughs> hey, man, coach him up. Coach him up. You know, offense wins in this league. Defense is expected to be coached up. And, and you see it, right? Look, look here's my case, yeah, to, no. here's my co- case to Coach Staley. Uh, Let's look at Seattle. You know, where, where was Tariq Woolen drafted? You know, and, and he ends up getting co- – let's talk about the, the Chiefs. you got four starters on defense. And, yeah, two of them were first-rounders, but they're late first-rounders and Karloftis and McDuffie. And, and then you had a guy in the sixth round that's starting in the secondary. They figured out how to coach him up. You know, let's, let's, let's go to Philadelphia. Like, coach him up, dude. Because, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll give you – I'm going to give you an offense that's – if I give you an offense that's – it's, it's almost like the Big 12, right? Hey, I'm going to give you an offense that can score X number of points. You know what I need out of you? I need two stops. That's all I need. If yeah. you can give me two stops, we're going to win a game. 
And um, I know DJ's been talking about it a lot. And, and I remember he, I was sitting at the table when he said it. You know, going into that Chiefs game, Gus Bradley said, if we can hold them to seven a quarter, we got a chance to win. That's saying, hey, I'm going to give up 28 points to the Chiefs, and I'm going to feel good about that because we got Justin Herbert, and, and I expect our offense to score 31. And I think that's, like, to me, that's just a very realistic approach to how yeah. you have to defeat the, the king of the, the – the king of the hill, the king that's in your – that's – they always say draft like that, that it's impossible. Like Tom says this all the time when he's, when he's asked, when he's interviewed, when he was with the Colts. Yeah, we drafted for our division, and teams drafted to stop us. So if you're drafting for your division, what do you think's the right – like I'm, I'm asking. I'm not saying that my, my answer is right. I'm just saying if you're drafting for your division, what do you think is the right approach to knock the, the Chiefs off the perch? Is it more defense or is it making Herbert more lethal? Like, I, I don't know the – that's my opinion what the answer is. I don't know what yours is. I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah, my opinion, I'm with you. I think you invest offensively and just keep getting as many weapons, whether that's weapons to protect Justin Herbert on the offensive line or weapons to attack downfield in the passing game. But I think you have a head coach who th- believes that if he has the right pieces and the right game plan that he can stop the Chiefs. And so I think that's going to be a factor in – in, in how they make decisions here as far as, like, drafting or building a team to to play against the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes. And and his, sorry, Chris, that's his scheme, though, right? He believes in his scheme. Yeah, huh, yep, exactly. So scheme exactly. it up, Coach. Scheme it up. Popper, my, my answer would be a running game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? My, okay. My, my answer would be a running game besides Austin Eckler. Like, what, what did Pacheco do in the playoffs? Like, and where do you find that guy? Do you find him in the first round? Do you get – if uh, the kid from Texas is there at 21, no, do you, I, you don't I, do it? Never in a million years would I draft a running back in the first round. I apologize to Austin and all running backs out there. I, I enjoy watching you guys play, but if I'm running a team, I would never, ever, ever, ever so who's draft the a running back in the first round. So, so who's hold the on, answer? let me make, let me make a counterpoint Did I make here, that Chris? clear? Ever. I'm, no. <laughs> I'll make a counterpoint to that. Okay. Right? okay. What did we talk about with Jacksonville? Austin Eckler rushed for negative three yards. John Robinson is a special player. I mean, this is we're not talking about, hey, this is the number one running back on the board. We're talking about Saquon Barkley. We are talking about Zeke Elliott. Like, that's the level of this guy coming out of college. He, you know, so if you feel like you're there, like if, if you feel like, hey, we're going to be able to bring back Trey, we've got this offensive line now. Slater's going to be healthy. Slater, Sawyer, Lindsley. Zion, Trey is up front. We've kept all three receivers. We feel good about getting a receiver in the second round. I am now going to drop in a three-down, do-everything hammer between the tackles, catches the ball out of the backfield, wiggle when he gets into open space. Like, that's, that's where it comes into the conversation. If it's Who, the by the way, makes your, makes your franchise quarterback even more lethal. Yeah. I mean, like to me, Pop, the reason you do it is if you believe it's the final piece. Like we've got yeah. everything else. Yes. So let's drop Robinson in there. And so like that's – I think that's where maybe you can make a case if a top – across the board, everybody you ask says, this is a top five player in the draft. The, the talent-wise, like this is the best running back we've seen come out probably – I mean – since Saquon, like that's how talented he is. Like there, there has not been anyone that's been remotely close to this talented. I and see. Now it. it's you all, can he's get off him Popper's board, Money. He's off Popper's board. No, it's not that he's. I I agree with what Money's saying. If you feel like you're a running back away, sure. That's what I'm this, saying. This roster is not a running okay, back away. So then that's that's the answer. That's not you know like is, they they have to be able to block at tight end for running back to have any sort of impact. Like that to me is a more important position to draft than than running back. You know. I don't know. Maybe I. It, but they also drafted a running back in the fourth round last year, who was the youngest player in the draft, and they're still waiting to see right. what he's going to be. Right. And we should have seen him in week eighteen, and we right. did. You know, I personally think that that Josh Kelly is is an ascending player. Like I don't, I just don't feel like they're they're running back away, and I don't think that a running back individually can affect the game without help. Like you need, like you can be the most right. talented running back in the world, but if you can't block, that's what I'm it saying. Do the Rock, do the Chargers have that? Do the Chargers have that help? Are I, they like, that help? I don't know. I, I don't, I, I'm not confident in how they can block at tight end. Okay. Yeah. We don't know if Trey Pipkins is going to be back. And then I also feel like, listen, Jamari Sawyer was, did a commendable job last year. We have not really seen him play guard. We saw it a little bit in right. training camp. And 
it's not like he was like an all pro player at left tackle either. And like, listen, super commendable job to be able to be a functional player at left tackle as a six round pick when no one expected it from you. I give him a ton of credit, but it's not like he was this excellent, right. excellent player out there. He was good. He was serviceable. He was serviceable, right? And I think we've gotten ahead of ourselves in terms of what he actually was out there. Like, he did have some issues against faster rushers with his movement skills. The stuff that people said, hey, we don't think this is – like, this is why we don't think he can play tackle in the NFL. He proved a lot of that wrong with just yeah. his positioning, his strength, and all of that kind of stuff. But I don't think it's a shoe in to be like, okay, you, know, you throw Jamari at, at left guard and bring Trey Pipkins back, and this is going to be like an elite run-blocking – unit you know obviously having Rashawn back is a big deal but I don't know because of some of those concerns I don't know if this offense and this team in general is like one star running back away from being like you know Super Bowl team yeah I'm, I'm like I said I was just asking you yeah, know, like yeah to me yeah. that's that's where the value of Robinson comes in yeah if you drop him onto a team that's ready he's he's going to be a lethal weapon yeah. I mean a, my, look, my look thing pop the, is it has to Chris. be addressed it has to be addressed at some point this year because because the first two years Brady Staley's been the head coach. They have not been able to run the ball effectively outside right. of Austin Eckler. So, you know, we, we spent all that first year saying, is it going to be Justin Jackson? Is it going to be Joshua Kelly? These guys have been hurt. This past year, you know, you know, Josh got hurt, but Josh had some nice moments. We didn't see Isaiah Spiller at all, so we don't really even know what he is right now as an NFL player. Um, they have to figure out something. So if it's not a superstar in the draft – do you get a guy in the third or fourth round like you've done the last couple of years or the last, you know, maybe like two out of the last five years? Or do you get a veteran like a Leonard Fournette who was just released or, you know, a, a Tony Pollard who is coming off an injury? Like, what do you do? Because Kellen Moore has proven that he can run a really effective offense with two running backs and, and get the ball down the field. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm – Maybe, yeah, we might be far apart on this, but I'm pretty comfortable with the running back group. Like, I don't look at, okay, they couldn't run the ball last year. It's because of the running backs. Like, I think Austin's a really special player. I, I loved what I saw from Josh Kelly. And you have a really young player in Isaiah Spiller that, you know, they're hoping will make some huge jump from year one to year two, which I think is, but is seven, a realistic seven thing. Yards, seven yards in the second half of a wild card playoff game is unacceptable. Right? Yeah. It, yeah, that but, can't happen. but pinning that, can't that exclusively on the running backs is – I don't think right. fair to them. Like a lot of it's no. blocking, a lot of it is uh, play the calling. commit yeah, play yeah, calling. A lot, a lot design. of it's designed runs that, that were not successful all year long. Like that's yeah. so that's where look, I Popper again, I was making more of a general argument for when you would draft a running back in the first round as opposed to saying the Chargers should draft him at twenty one. I think it'd be interesting. Because if, in fact, it'd be a great opportunity for Tom Telesco to prove, oh, yeah, we are a best player available team, because I can promise you, if he is there at 21, there is not going to be a player that is considered better than him at 21. It's just not going to happen. So yeah. that'll put that to the test. Um, I would much rather see a Dalton Kincaid there, a Jordan Addison there, if they're available, 100%. Yeah. You know, yeah. one of the edge rushers there, if 100%, like not, not even close. Is but but I that would that would certainly put it to the test. Is if he's, let's just say there's Nolan Smith, Jordan Addison, Dalton Kincaid, and, and Bijan Robinson are there. Okay, well now now we're really putting that to the test. Uh, I don't know if you drafted the best player available as opposed to you drafted for need. Yeah, I think I think they feel like in terms of the running game that Kellen Moore is going to be able to schematically and design wise get that thing going in a way that, I agree. that Joe Lombardi was never able to from a commitment standpoint play calling standpoint how they're preparing like all of that stuff was a big issue um with joe and it's a big reason why they moved on from him um it's going to look different there's going to be a different commitment to it and they're putting a lot on on kellen moore's uh, taking this offensive coordinator job as, as to why they think the running game yeah. you know will improve and and you know having rashawn slater back at left tackle will help too I that think. helps do you think hey do you think isaiah spiller can be the guy popper it's austin not the guy this guy scored no, 20 touchdowns in back-to-back seasons. I'm not seasons. talking about Austin. Yeah. Austin we I think, know what I think, Austin yeah. is. For, yeah. I think Austin for Austin, is the guy. Is, I'm, talking about, what, I'm talking about a guy who can compliment Austin consistently yeah. for 17 So games. he's healthy yeah. at the yeah. end of the year. I think Josh can I, be I that guy. Yeah. Do you guys not think Josh can be that guy? I do. I, I, I do. I just, just um, 100%. Look, I, yeah. like I said, my, my big issue, like I just don't understand. What, I, I don't know how many games we had Larry Rounds reactive. Like, that, that's something that'll never make sense to me. Never. Like, the fact that Isaiah, especially in Week 18, I just that's one thing I cannot reconcile. I, I just, I'll, I'll never understand the thinking behind that. 
And I know they keep saying, well, we didn't know the outcome of that game, you know, when we had to turn in, you know, our rosters. But they were up by 10 with like six minutes left when you had to turn in your inactives. Yes, games can get weird, or, or they were up by like 14 or something. And it's like, I need to see what Isaiah Spiller can do, man. I, I need to see – and this is a perfect opportunity to get that and to keep mm. Austin healthy. Mm. So I think, like, to me it's not I, – I, I, look, it'd be ridiculous to doubt Austin. We've talked about it all the time. The fact that he's not an all-pro is asinine. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, Nothing like, to, to me also. it's keeping him healthy for – and I think that's what even Austin has talked about. He's like, hey, man, I need one of these guys to raise their hand because he gets the crap kicked out of him, you know? And, and he, we, we say it all the time, right? He refuses to go down on first contact. So he really gets beat up through the course of a season. And you need to have a Tony Pollard, Zeke Elliott kind of deal, I think, with, with Austin to even make him more effective. Um, not to mention, if you're Kellen Moore, you think, you've got to believe he wants to have him freaking set up in the slot or outside wide of the numbers if he can have a hammer back there. And now you're really – affecting the math I, I, I would love to see more of that like we yeah. saw with Shane I remember Shane would do it all the time and it was awesome you know you see that that linebacker trot out there with Austin it's like oh you're dead you know and and it was I think you need to see some more of that but I'm with you I, I think it's on I, I just don't think they know you know like I'm not sure I'm not sure if they the, it's the like to me Chris to your point I don't think the answer is in the third round or the fourth round. They've already got enough of those guys. Josh Kelly's yeah. that guy. Isaiah Spiller could be that guy. To me, it's, it's hey, do we believe we're close enough? Holy cow, how did this guy fall into our lap? You know, that's where the, the conversation would come in. That's, that, that, yeah. that's the only one to me. I think this conversation would be a little bit different if Josh hadn't, you know, sprained his MCL on a you know, kickoff return blocking in, in yeah. week five and then misses right. four weeks. He looked you know, really that good. That Cleveland game, like, year. yeah, you know, I, I – I really have a lot of belief in him as a player from what I've seen. And then and then you can expect dramatic improvement from Isaiah Spiller, the youngest player in the draft who now right. has a full off season to get bigger. Like that's one thing Joe Lombardi talked a lot about when they drafted him. Like it's gonna take some time for him to fill into his body because he's twenty years old, you know, when they drafted him. And so I, I'm I'm more comfortable with it than than I think you guys are. Like I think they have a decent room and I think they've got a lot of potential in that room as well, where like, you know, drafting another running back doesn't make a whole ton of sense yeah. to me but. well and you know what chris you asked about pacheco like to me that's josh kelly you know pacheco's straight line straight line speed power he's just gonna run yep. you over you know you're not gonna not a lot of wiggle there but you know tell him where the hole is he's gonna hit it and it's gonna be yeah. a pain in the ass to bring him down and that's what pacheco was it's not like he was some sort of dynamic runner you know that you can't believe everybody missed on until the seventh round the chiefs used him perfectly for what they needed and i think uh, i'm with you pop look i have no problems with the the running back room i just wish i knew more about it yeah, you know, I wish I, I that, that's that's my only issue. Hundred percent, that too. It, you know, I, I was so high on Isaiah Spiller just looking at what he did at A and M. You know, and and the fact that we didn't see him this year was disappointing because now you go into year two and you're like, well, why why didn't he get more run? Like, you know, especially if they had trouble running the football, why didn't he get more run last year? So, you know, a lot of this offseason pop is just going to be kind of projection when it comes to um, Spiller. But I'm with you. Like, like we saw in, in Money and I sat down with. Josh uh, in in training camp, and he looked like a different dude. He he was joking that he dropped the raisin canes and you know changed his diet and everything, and you could definitely see that. Yeah, that was uh, all real. He was not joking. Like he did all like he yeah he did all that. He looked great himself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Yeah. you're right. I think injuries. Basically, the Chargers they need to figure out what that plan is though. um, Week one and and make sure that that's a successful plan. Hey. uh, Pop, let's just say, you know, not being ridiculous, you know, Jalen Carter's not falling to 21, but just give us a name. Like, who would you like to see it? Like, realistic. Realistic, who would you like to see at 21 that you think could be there? Jordan Addison. Yeah, that's yeah. the guy. Like, I, I'm, I'm with you, Money. Like, like the, the case you were making about just add weapons, just give me weapons, just invest yeah. in this offense, because they tried to run, this, run the thing back. Year over year, they didn't really make a ton of changes. You know, they added Zion and Gerald Everett, but that was pretty much it. Like, if you have a quarterback that's that good and you're in a division with Patrick Mahomes, like, just get weapons, elite weapons. And if the, you know, a lot of people have him as the top receiver on the board. If you can get him at 21, like, got some big playability, can make some plays after the catch, like, create some explosivity with your offense. Here's one. You know, that's that's the direction I would go. Yeah. All right. Chris Kincaid. And Addison are both available at 21. 
Now what do you do? I'm taking the tight end. Right? I think I'm taking Kincaid, yeah. Right? I get my own, give, me, give me my own Kelsey. Exactly. And look, it's stupid to say he's Travis Kelsey, who's arguably going to go down as the greatest pass-catching tight end <laughs> of, of all time. But I'm with, like, I, I, everybody talked about, oh, what are you going to do with Tyreek Hill gone? Yeah, you, you can't cover Travis Kelsey. You can't. It, it's not possible. And I think um, – but I just don't know if he's going to – yeah, there there is a case for him to slide, right? He's what twenty four, I think he's twenty four, twenty five. Um, had the injuries, but man, you look at that production, and it's eight touchdowns, eleven touchdowns, eleven touchdowns, like sixteen touchdowns year after year after. It's crazy what the production is. It's so Kelsey esque. But I'm I'm with you too, Pop. I think Addison of all the guys, you know, people are, are excited about the speed of, of Hyatt. It's a little bit too much of a one trick pony. Mm. Um, I'd be a little worried about that. And it's a one year deal. Um, you know, the look, if Lane Kiffin was still the, the head coach at, at USC, Addison would have had 200 catches for 6,000 yards. That's yeah. the way they would have <laughs> him, you know, but, but Lincoln is more of a, a head coach. That's fine with just telling Caleb, Hey, just wherever the open guy is, that's where you're going to put it. So he didn't have, that that season and I'm hoping that leads him to get pushed down I think Kincaid ends up getting drafted inside the top 15 I just I there's too much Travis Kelsey to his game for that to happen and but I, I think you're right on Addison I think that's I think that's a realistic be possibility fun. that and a lot of it's going to depend on what he runs you know if he runs in the the low four fours then zero chance um if, if he ends up being that high you know if that low four five eh, Maybe. 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 I, uh, watch out for tight end, though. It's going to be a big part of this, this offense that Kellen Moore is building. Think about 100%. who they had in, in Dallas. So, like, they need, they need all, like, legit all-around tight ends that can play as run blockers, pass catchers. Like, that's going to be a, a, a big point of emphasis while they build this offense. Yeah. So. Guys, what's the drop-off? What, what do you think the drop – maybe not drop-off because they're kind of two different players, but uh, Mayer from Notre Dame versus Kincaid. You know, what, what would well, you Well, Mayer's say? the full tight end. Kincaid's he, a pass catcher. He, he does Kincaid it Kincaid is Travis yeah. Kelsey. Yeah. Mayer is more your Hawkinson. Yeah. Um, you know, if you watch Mayer, he's he's great, but like it just it doesn't look like Kincaid. Kincaid, there's separation. There's no receivers. There's nobody around him, and they're trying to stop him. And all of a sudden, you just it's like Kelsey. It's like you know that's the guy you have to stop, and yet why is he wide open? Because that's just how good he is. That's how mm. Kincaid's been at Utah. Mayer, you know, you, you put him on the edge, and he can block. But mm. when he catches the ball, there's guys around him, and there's not that suddenness. And it's just he's still great. Hawkinson is great. You know, he's, he's a great player. I, I just think that's – at least that's kind of how I would classify it is, is I think that's – you're talking about – if you want to say, hey, what's their ceiling? I think it's Hawkinson, Mayer, and, you know, Kelsey, Kincaid. Those are the more of the style of tight like that, ends that we're talking about. <laughs> that, and that's, again, ceiling. That's best case. It all works out perfectly for these first-round tight ends. I just think that's the style that you're talking yeah. about. Pop, we'll get you out of here uh, on this. We're not there in Indy. You are uh, beyond the combine. Just where are you eating? Are you doing a hops with Pop? You have a special Indianapolis beer that you're going to break out. Like wh what's been going on at, at night in Indianapolis? That's where all the fun happens. Yeah, just you know, you're schmoozing. A little Prime Forty Seven action. A little uh, sure. St. Elmo's action. Too much steak. Too much mashed potatoes. I need a salad. Someone please send me a salad. Please, I forgot you're please. a big beer guy. Uh, I, I mean, like, yeah, I, I like, I, I big, oh, that's big just alcohol clever, guy. That's just a, uh, that's just nah, uh, I, mean, I like, I like to have. Are like you a beer crap, guy or no? Crack up like, a cold. You, yeah, I'm not like a snobby like. Okay. You know, I'll yeah, I like I drink Bud Light. Okay. When I feel like it, you know, so I'm not like that snobby Whatever. like you know, but I I like a good IPA, you know, find okay. the elder. So there's a uh, the best IPA in my opinion. Or in the conversation in the world is based in Indiana. It is, uh, and they cannot ship uh, domestically. They can only stay in states that touch Indiana. So you can only get it if you're, you know, in Indiana or Kentucky or Illinois or Ohio or Wisconsin or Michigan. You get the point. Uh, it's Three Floyds, and it's called Zombie Dust. So I've had while it you're, while you're, you've had it. I'm pretty sure. Well, yeah. yeah, I would I would imagine you could while you're or Alpha King if you want to get something a little bit heavier if you like okay. a heavier IPA the Alpha dust. King is their heavier Zombie Dust is their kind of straight down the middle IPA Alpha All King right. is their a little heavier. All right, uh, I'll keep an eye out for it. And you know what, Space Station Middle Finger also very good. Uh, three. Floyd's That's another beer. indie beer. 
That's another. They're all three Floyds. They're out of Munster, Indiana, Northwest Indiana. All right. Uh, great, great stuff. I'll look get after that, huh? I will. Popper, right Popper, best in the business, buddy. We appreciate you st- spending a, an hour with us. My goodness. Yeah, no problem. We had to catch up. We had a lot to get to. Exactly. We had a lot to get to. And, and I'm and, sure we'll do it again soon. And guess what? We still don't know anything. We don't know what's yeah, going on. Yeah, best time of the year. <laughs> Just right? speculate until, you're, until you get hoarse from yelling about different things and then – you're not going to know until March 15th anyway. So, exactly. yeah, it's great. That's it. All right. All right, Chase fellas. Travels from Indy for money. I'm Chris. This has been Chargers Weekly. All right, guys. This is the official hospitality provider of the NFL. On Location offers unrivaled access to experience all premier NFL events like never before. On Location brings you up close for all the action, providing fans with unforgettable moments from draft day to Super Bowl Sunday and everything in between. On Location, thrilled to announce its new partnership with the Pro Football Hall of Fame. This August, kick off football season in Canton, Ohio, and be there live to witness the class of 2023 enshrinement. The NFL also headed back to London and Germany for the 2023 NFL International Games. On Location official packages will feature game tickets, deluxe hotel accommodations, private tours, pregame hospitality, end-to-end planning, and more. Be sure to secure your priority access today. Visit NFLOnLocation.com or search NFL On Location today. Your football experience of a lifetime awaits only with On Location.